Welcome to another episode of Money You Should Ask, where everyone has something they can teach you. I'm your host, Bob Wheeler. In this episode, we are going to explore why we do what we do when it comes to money. As a CPA for the past 30 years, wait, let me say 25 because that makes me sound younger. I have seen it all when it comes to money and emotions. And if you think I'm talking about my clients, I'm not. I'm talking about myself. My relationship with money has been, and sometimes still is, an emotional roller coaster. Maybe that's something you're also familiar with. Good news. You and I are not the only ones. Our next guest is going to share their money beliefs, money blocks, and life challenges as well. Buckle your seatbelt and enjoy the ride. Our next guest is Rachel Murphy, who has worked with young people for almost 25 years as a youth director, a foster parent, a mentor to young adults, and a mom to five children, ages 8 to 24. Through the years, Rachel was surprised by how many teens lacked easily taught life skills that would help launch them out independently. Rachel and her family created Raising Confident Teens podcast and Facebook community to help teach life and leadership skills to teens and empower parents as they navigate preparing their teens for adulthood. Rachel is the author of the book, I Am Not Your ATM, A Practical Plan for Teaching Your Teen to Manage Money. And you got to show us a copy of the book, Rachel. Oh. Show us that book. Yeah, yeah. I'm not your ATM. Not your ATM. I am not an ATM. And Rachel is also part of the FinCon community, which is this amazing group of financial money nerds, which nerd is a positive thing in my book. Rachel, it's so awesome to have you here. Thank you. I'm happy to be here because I love you, Bob, because you make money fun, which a lot of people don't do. It's got to be fun. Life is short. Yeah. We get stressed enough in life. And if we can't make it a little bit of fun, it's just painful. (laughs) It's just painful. If you can't laugh at yourself, who can you laugh at? Exactly. And we're our best critics. And so we know all the, the places to get us with the humor. So yeah, that's my hope. Now, I love the title of the book, I'm Not Your ATM, which totally makes sense when you're dealing with kids because it feels like (laughs) a payout. I don't know if your parents had ATMs. So were your parents your ATM or were they just your bank? It was a different ballgame back then. Yeah. I feel like it's a lot different now than it was back then. Yeah, I think so. Now, one of the things I love in your book, I feel like there's a bit of sarcasm and humor, tongue in cheek kind of stuff. So for example, for people that are thinking, should I get this book and try and help my teens? A couple of things that might help you know if this book is for you or if it's not for you, because Rachel doesn't want to waste anybody's time. So if your teen has a job, pays all their own expenses, can handle savings and delayed gratification, this book is probably not for you, right? If you don't want to expend any effort and just hope it will all work out in the future, this book is definitely not for you. Yes. So I'm sure everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's me. Here's one thing that is important that Rachel does say, and I, I really... I can't stress this enough for so many people that say it's too late to get started. This has to be a priority. It will never be a good time to start. You just have to make time. Anything new or different feels a little scary. It's okay. In just a few months, you will look back and be glad you got started. I think that's the biggest thing for so many people is just getting started. Yeah, in any project, not money, anything. Yeah. In the people that you've talked to, in the teams that you've worked with, and in the coaching that you've done... Is there a common theme about this fear that you can share with us about, like, just get started, just do it? I think for a lot of people, they just feel inadequate. Like, I don't know, especially parents, I don't know enough to teach my kids because nobody taught me when I was a teenager. So I'm just going to let the school do it, which is not really happening. Right. Or maybe they'll pick it up somewhere along the way. Or I can lecture them and tell them, don't do this don't do what I do or don't do credit cards. But to them, that's like Charlie Brown's teacher. It's just like, wow, wow, wow. They don't internalize lectures. I think it's a vulnerable thing, but I think being able to say honestly to your teens, look, I didn't get the lessons. There's no bad guys here. I just didn't get the lessons. So let's learn this together. Or I may teach you a couple of things and I might get it wrong a couple of times, but let's tackle this so that you don't have to go through the misinformation that I did. 
And I think it's good that they see us get it wrong. Like for a long time, many, many years, I always felt like I'd make a budget and I would feel like that would have to be the budget. I didn't realize you change it every month. Right. You know, it, it fits whatever you're doing for the month. I thought I'd have to spend all these hours crafting this perfect budget and this is what is going to guide me the rest of the year. And it took me a long time to realize this is a fluid thing and it's going to change every month depending on what I have going on in my life. And they need to learn that. They don't learn that, you know, by osmosis. They don't. And like myself, for the longest time, I thought if you said yes to something, you had to go all the way through. You couldn't stop and say, wait, this is painful. I changed my mind. It's no longer a priority. I thought once you sort of like the budget, once you commit to it, you have to stay the course forever. And life is fluid. Right. And we do have to be able to stop and say, wait a minute, this isn't serving me or it is serving me. It's a little uncomfortable, but it's serving me. Whatever that might be. For me, I did not get a lot of those skills. And again, this is not a blame game here. My parents did what they could. They didn't have a lot of resource and information. And so we were all just blindly doing it. So right. not about blaming our parents. It's about oh, I didn't get the information. Most people didn't. Right. And our parents' generation were in a different boat. They didn't have credit cards. So naturally, they had boundaries. Like, you run out of money, you have to stop spending. Right. So they didn't know to teach us, this is how you manage credit. This is what you need to avoid. Look at what this will do to you if you put this on a credit card, how much it's really going to cost you in the end. They didn't know to teach us those lessons. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things that, and I'm going to share one of your stories in the chapter, chapter one, but it's so relevant because I think like with my parents and your parents and almost everybody's parents, everybody had really good intentions. Nobody said, let's mess them up financially. Let's see how we can hold them back educationally. There was this, I have a dream and I'm going to take this little bean and I'm going to do the best that I can. And then life gets in the way. I want to share this first little paragraph that I love because I think for a lot of people, they can resonate with this because all of a sudden, here we are, right? You start with this senior in college who met this long-haired rocker wannabe. They would spend hours and hours planning their lives and talking about how great life was going to be. They wanted to have a house and a family and work with young people. They had lots of big dreams for the future. Like most young couples, they begin their marriage full of positivity and ready to change the world. But less than 10 years later, their dreams had all seemingly slipped out of their grasp. And then we're into reality, and where did the fairy tale go? And I just want to give you a chance to sort of talk about, for you, how that was, this idealistic, we're going to make it all happen, and then several years later, oh my gosh, how did we get here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always, oh, we live the high life. And we spend a lot of money on, you know, cars and good times. For a lot of people, it is just living. And we made some bad choices. We started a business. We started an internet service provider back in the day when that was a thing. We just kept it going longer than we should have because a lot of times people start businesses and they can't let them go because it's their baby. Right. And so we kept it going with credit cards and ended up $50,000 in debt when we sold it and no income to pay for that. And like you said, we turn around and we're like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> what happened? And do you think most people have to reach the crash before they can change their mind? Like, how do we get past? And maybe it's partly the sunk cost bias. Maybe it's because it's our baby. How do we, and what did you do? Was it the crash that made you say, we have to stop and rethink this? Well, we just knew we couldn't go on any further, but it was a, just because we decided we're going to pay this off, we're going to get out of this debt, we didn't magically all of a sudden have a perfect life. I mean, it took years and years of digging out of debt. And our biggest problem was not our financial problem. Our biggest problem was we didn't believe in ourselves. Right. And we'd gone through that business loss. And then I talk about my husband went through three layoffs in nine months during the dot-com crash. And we lost a baby in between there. And so it was like, we totally didn't believe in ourselves and we didn't think we were capable of succeeding. He drove a taxi for six or seven years and we lived in the worst neighborhood in our town, drove $1,500 cars. We were still digging out of debt. Mm -hmm. But I feel like if we could have got a hold of getting our mindset right, we could have 
gotten out of that mess a whole lot faster. <laughs> Absolutely. And you talk about how like making that decision to dig yourself out was a really, really hard decision. Even though in the midst of comfortable not moving forward, it was still a really difficult conversation and a decision to like, we're going to push through it and there's not going to be overnight success and driving a, a Ferrari. It's there's going to be some painful years or some lean years. And you made that anyway. Is it faith? What's the light that keeps you going when you're telling yourself, I'm not enough. We didn't do it right. We're not meeting our expectations. How did you keep it going? It's really weird because I talk about how like we went back and forth. Should we declare bankruptcy? Should we not declare bankruptcy? We talked to tons of people and everybody was telling us to do it. So I can totally understand people who have been there and done that because it's, you are beat down. But then once we decided, it became more like a challenge. Like, can we do this? And then it, it was never after we decided, decided. It wasn't like tomorrow we're changing our mind. It was, I don't know. Commitment, I guess. Yeah. It's like taking action, like we're talking about how action is the hardest part. Once you decide to take the action, that's the biggest step you have to take. It is so hard. And I was doing a show a couple of days ago and I was thinking about how when I was up to my head drowning in debt, how I kept thinking it wasn't possible. And then creating little savings accounts of five bucks and 20 bucks and automated myself to try and start just getting little bits so I could feel like I had at least something I could grab onto. And it seemed impossible at that time. Yet consistently chipping it away, I was able to finally, whew, at least my head's above the water. Right. Uh, oh, now I've got a foot on the bottom of the pond. <laughs> something that really helped back then is listening to other people. Like we didn't have much back then yeah. like we do now. There's so many books and so many resources. Back then it was pretty much Dave Ramsey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we would listen to the debt-free Fridays where people would get on and scream, I'm debt-free. That was pretty motivating because we're like, people are doing it. Right. And we're not the only people out here. Finding people who are going through what you're going through, I think is huge when you're going through something like that. Don't get around your friends who are spending all their money and living on the edge with their credit. You got to find new friends if that's if that's where you're at. You got to find new friends. I think one of the other things that it feels important to me, it seems like it might have been important to you. At the end of the book, you actually express appreciation for your husband, Keith, for letting you dream your dreams and going through it with you. And I know sometimes when I'm working with couples, I'm not surprised anymore, where they're not even on the same page financially or on the same page of nurturing each other's dreams. So it feels to me like having the right team, having the right partner can do thousands quicker advancement when you've got somebody that doesn't always have to agree with you, but that supports you fully and doesn't knock you, give you an extra punch when you're down, but they try and comfort you and hold you up in the midst of all this stuff. Yeah, because they've been through it all with you and they're going to celebrate it all with you. But when we were going through all those hard times and he was like, totally not believing in himself and driving the cab. I let him be there. Yeah. Which is hard, right? Yeah. It's hard. Look, Bob, you made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, this is why I love your book, because you spill it all and you don't hide anything back. We don't have to be vulnerable, but when we're vulnerable. Yeah, that is where the change happens. We went through this. This has been 20 years ago. But only in the last year have we told our story to anybody, like even our parents. We didn't tell. Yeah. They didn't have a clue what we went through. And it was so freeing to just like, what did we wait for? Whew. Right? Yeah. That's what I love about you is you get on. You're so open with your screw ups. <laughs> I've had a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. For me, I had so much shame. I was a CPA. And I was just making all these personal bad choices and the shame cat had to keep it. I had to keep it hidden. And yeah. that's so much pressure. Yeah. But people need to hear your story because I had a friend who read the book. She was part of our launch team and she came to me and said, I had no idea. I've been looking at you and like you guys live in a nice house and you don't have to work outside the house. 
and your kids are in private school. And I had no idea the mess you had to go through right there. You know? <laughs> right. They, they see the snapshot and go, wow, <laughs> must be nice. I was totally not relatable to her. Yeah. Until she read my story. Yeah. And, and that's why I love doing these podcasts. I love connecting with people because I've met people that other people say, oh, my God, I wish I were just like them. Like, no, actually. If you knew the story uh, and the sacrifice yeah. and the pain that it took to get there, you might rethink it, right? It's a journey. Yeah. And journeys are not just a straight l- line to happiness and riches. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of choice. And when you're going through it, you don't think to yourself, oh, in 20 years, it'll all be great. And I'll be on a podcast talking about, it. you know, you're like, I want to die. Yeah. Yeah. I wish a car would come across and hit me, you know, because I don't have the guts to kill myself. (laughs) Exactly. I exactly know that feeling of I'm not quite courageous enough to go through with it. But man, staying here is a little bit intolerable right now. It It just doesn't feel like I can. It's painful. Yeah. And lonely. It's very isolating in those financial struggles. Yeah. Yeah. I remember we, you know, we'd go to church and then after church, everybody go out to eat and we'd go home and eat our ramen noodles. Yeah. It'd be like. And I wasn't really sad about it at the time, but like I could have been, that could have been really (laughs) depressing. It could have been. I went through my ramen noodle phase and for a long time I couldn't even eat eat Uh, those little plastic bags of. My kids called it man soup. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, it's helped many a people. It is an important piece of that survival kit. Now you have made it a mission to really help children with financial literacy. And it's not taught in schools. And so for the folks that are letting their kids learn it in school, they're not going to learn it. Right. Right. And you've got some great statistics in the book. Why for you is it important to pay this forward? Well, I don't want my own kids to go through what we went through. It was that's hard on your marriage. That's hard on everything. Yeah. I don't want any kid to have to go through that. You know, why go through it when you can avoid it? You don't have to suffer like that. A lot of times we teach our kids when they're little bitty, you know, we have the giving and the saving and the spending envelopes. Right. But between that and kicking you out into the real world, there is nothing. You may get a few lectures, but there's no real practical knowledge. It'd be kind of like, okay, we're going to teach our kid how to drive. So at our house, when we just had our third one learn to drive. So at our house, you start out in the parking lot. And then you go from the parking lot to the subdivision. Right. And then you go from the subdivision to a not so busy highway. And then you go from that to maybe in town. And then from there to the interstate. And then from there to Atlanta. Right. (laughs) That's a good drive. (laughs) But the normal kid, this is how they kind of learn finances. It's the equivalent of here, let's start out in the parking lot. We're going to do spending, savings, giving. Now from there, let's go to Atlanta in the rain at night. Right. (laughs) Like there's nothing like, you know, you hear so many stories of kids in college where they like get their first card and they just max it out. They have no clue what they're doing. No clue. It's free money. Just doing with their friends. It's free money. It says you've got $10,000. You got to spend it. Yeah. Eventually I'll get that job. I know I will. And then it'll all be fine. It's coming. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Now, can they parallel park? Oh, not very well. I can't parallel park, so. (laughs) I I have to out my sibling. She can parallel park if there's five empty parking spaces. She can coast in and take the one in the middle. (laughs) Yeah, that's probably me. I'm like, that's not really parallel parking. Fortunately, that is a skill I learned. But yeah, parking and driving and actually driving your finances, it takes developing skills. Right. And you got to learn ownership. They don't learn ownership of anything involving money a lot of times. Well, there's this great quote by Ayn Rand that you have, money is only a tool. It will take you wherever you wish, but it will not replace you as the driver. So. With the finances, we still have to be in the driver's seat right? and be intentional and be conscious. And I love that you're working with your kids. Of course, it'd be fun to interview your kids. And I'm sure if people listen to your podcast, the kids spill the beans on some of that stuff because they're on the receiving end of parents going through their own personal struggles and their own journey that may not be parallel to the kids. Yeah. They hear stories and the older ones are like, the younger ones have no clue what we went through, you know? 
Right. The music man that comes through the neighborhood that That's plays right. music. Right. Yeah, my brother outed it out and said, that guy sells ice cream. I'm like, what? <laughs> my kids aren't supposed to know that. Yeah, shh. <laughs> it's just a music truck. Don't tell them. <laughs> So I know money is taboo for a lot of people. We just don't talk about it. Right. Was money taboo in your family with your parents? No, it wasn't really taboo. Well, in some ways it was, in some ways it wasn't. My parents were good about talking about money mm -hmm. and they tried to teach me about money. But I think a lot of it is because it's just theory and you don't grasp a lot of it. They were, my parents were amazing with money. I do not know to this day how they did it because my dad was enlisted military mm -hmm. and they saved a third of their income they gave away a third of it and they lived on a third of it wow they were like wizards <laughs> i don't know how they did it wow yeah like they put a couple of my uncles and aunts through college the 18 bazillion aunts and uncles <laughs> yeah and they're very they would probably not want me telling you all this but they're very humble and giving people it. but you know they could make the money stretch like We'd be eating stuff out of the yard. I'm like, oh, look, there's an edible plant here. Did you kids know that? You know, that is awesome. <laughs> so do you think being in the military helped with their structure on that? Or even if they hadn't been in the military, they would have just been creative and able to make that dollar stretch. That's a great way to, hey, we're learning science. You can eat stuff in the yard <laughs> and we're saving a buck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a funny story. One day my dad comes running in the house and says, Honey, give me a pot. I just hit a frog. <laughs> yeah, they would eat pretty much anything. I don't know if it's because my mom was raised in the third world country. Uh -huh. They weren't really poor. Her dad was a businessman, but I mean, they had lots of kids, so they were pretty good at stretching the money. Yeah. And my dad was raised on a farm, kind of like a sharecropper. Yeah. Some of that was their generation, just like resourceful. And, and I have a sense, I could be wrong, but I feel like especially people that come to the U.S. from developing countries have a much bigger appreciation and less of a sense of entitlement when it comes to living and making things happen. It seems to me there's a bit more awareness for the majority of people that we don't all get born at Buckingham Palace and we don't all have it rolling in. Do you think any of that played a part? Mm. I think it depends on the country, actually, because my parents work internationally a lot. There's a difference between Chinese from China and Chinese from Taiwan. Right. You tend to have all the Chinese restaurants, and, you know. Right. Some of those countries, there is a lot of wealthier people now whose kids are just like American kids who think that. Right. I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, your parents, how you were raised to think about money. Yeah. You've got this money plan path. Right. That lays things out about setting out your goals and picking your categories. And you also emphasize charity, community service, all those kinds of things. And you even, you have a contract that you, now did all of your kids sign the contract? No, we didn't do that. Oh, you didn't do that. But that's something, because it's a great idea. Yeah, I just added that in for parents that wanted it, because some parents like to be all official and stuff. <laughs> well, there is something to being held accountable, right? Yeah. To acknowledging I'm going to get a salary right. of so much money and... There's consequences if, it, if I don't contribute and there's an expectation for you to participate in the family. It's very transparent. Right. I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. Can I take a second here and just explain yeah. how this works? Because I want people to be able to do this whether they buy my book or not. Yeah. So how we teach our kids is once they turn fifth or sixth grade, we start turning over parts of the budget to them that are related to them, like something they would be interested in. Right. So like, say your family goes out for ice cream once a week. Instead of mom or dad standing at the counter and paying the bill for everyone, the first of the month, you hand the kids their salary. This is your ice cream money for the month. Right. You have to budget it, keep up with it. If we get to the fourth week and we go for ice cream, you know, and you don't have the money, then I'm sorry you don't get ice cream. Oh. You got to be a little bit tough sometimes. You do. You do. You actually have a consequence. You need to understand consequence. Yeah. Don't bail them out because... Would you rather have them learn it on ice cream or on a $10,000 credit card bill? Right. That's how we start. We start small with things that don't really hurt if they blow it. Maybe you give them money for school lunches. Give it to them once a month and let them do it. And if they run out of money, then they can pack a lunch. You don't just give them more money. And so every year we add more categories and they get a higher salary. And 
by the time they graduate high school, they're managing 10, 15 categories that, you know, they buy their own school supplies. They buy, do their own haircuts, clothes, makeup. If they are in sports, they do concessions and food out when they're at away games, mm -hmm. youth activities, gasoline. So that gives them a chance to practice the skills of managing their budget. They get to learn, oh, this is one a lot of people have struggled with, the sinking fund. Okay. I don't need a haircut this month, but I'm going to need one next month. Girls' haircuts are not cheap. Right. So I need to set aside some money this month and next month. Kind of like our insurance bills for a lot of people. Like, it is not a surprise you're getting an insurance bill. You know you have an insurance it's coming. <laughs> payment, but then you don't think about it and then it blows up at you. They learn it in a safe environment where they can ask questions. Because if they have to learn this all on their own, it's so much easier I start when I'm in fifth or sixth grade, and then I only have one or two categories. Right. And then I reconcile one or two categories. And then next year, I maybe have five categories. And then that's way easier than going from nothing to, oh, now I'm in college. Oh, there are 200 transactions on my statement? Right. What? How do I do that? You kind of ease them into it. You ease them into it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to be that parent that says, intentional parenting is a lot of work. Right. Well. <laughs> My thought on that is, do you want them to come back and live in your basement? That's my thought. <laughs> <laughs> that's something to think about. I know many people that have their 30-year-old children now living with them. And sometimes that's necessary. You know, there's, there are cases where that's needed, but sometimes it's just because they didn't learn to adult. Yeah. They're not going to go out and ask their friends when they're in college, hey, how do I do a budget? Right. Because that is totally not cool. Right. If they don't learn it from you... They're not going to really learn it. And it's going to be, they're going to have to recover from all the mistakes they made during the period when they could have been building well. Yeah. So I say, you know, if you're interested in starting this with your kid, just think of one category you could start with. Just one. And then just start. Here's your money for the month. One step at a time. Baby step, baby step. And you can walk a few miles. Yeah. When you just start doing it. I'm going to read one more quote because I, I loved all the quotes and I, I'm a quote person. I loved all these quotes. This one is from Ralph Walder Emerson. And he says, without ambition, one starts nothing. Without work, one finishes nothing. The prize will not be sent to you. You have to win it. For me, what that's just saying is we got to participate, whether it's for the children's success, for our own success, for our own financial literacy, for future generations. We got to put some skin in the game. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's Publishers Clearinghouse is not coming no. to your door. No. I've actually had, I've had a couple of clients do this where they've called me up and they'll say, Bob, I think we need to probably set up a corporation for me. I think I might win the lottery. And if I get the $30 million, I want to be ready for it. And I'll say, that's great. You've got some time when you get the winning ticket. I can get you incorporated when you get the ticket. And Let's talk then. Publisher's Clearinghouse is probably not coming. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry to break it to you, people. <laughs> it's, it's just not. Uh, man. Listen, we are at our Fast Five, which is brought to you by Greenlight, which is the debit card for kids managed by parents. So, Rachel, we're going to shift the energy just a little bit, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out some questions for you, top of mind. When did you stop becoming an ATM to your children? Or are you still sometimes an ATM? No, I've never been an ATM. Except the monthly cheap, <laughs> <laughs> the monthly withdrawal. And I don't even do that anymore. It automatically goes to their accounts. It just eliminates so much of the stress of mom can have money. What'd you do with the money I gave you last time? You know, like kids love control. Oh, it's very empowering. Yes. And they love whipping out their wallets when they're yeah. with their friends. Let them be. They'll still have a home to come to and they'll still get fed, even with the mistakes. Yeah. What was a memorable money moment in your childhood? Hmm. Man, memorable money moment. Well, I, you know, I always used to like, I was a saver. I would hoard all the money and my brother would blow all of his and then he would come to me <laughs> <laughs> and try to work deals. Right. It's funny how like our personalities show up even at a young age, you know? Yeah. I had that saver thing, you know, I even candy. I would, I had this little white purse. And I would shove all my candy in it and he would eat all his and then he'd come. Hey, how about we split that? <laughs> yeah, sometimes <laughs> the ones that are doing the work get punished or guilted into having to share their good 
yeah, habits. Yeah. That's hard when you're a saver that marries a spender. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh, Keith. We know. We know. He's he's way better now. Okay. He's way better. <laughs> How often do you revise your budget now? You know, we talked about that earlier that you found out, oh, you get to revise it every swap. So every month. Every month. I look yeah, I work on it. Yeah. That's every awesome. month is different, especially with five kids. Yeah. I mean, there's all kinds of weird stuff that pops up. Absolutely. I'm one of five kids. What is one of your financial habits that you don't want your kids to follow? You know, sometimes I can tend to be a little too stingy. Like I don't want to spend money on myself. Mm -hmm. And I don't want them to feel like you can't enjoy life. And I've gotten better about it once I started doing sinking funds and like there's a clothing budget. Right. So I don't feel like I'm spending the groceries on clothes. You know, that helps a lot. If you don't do that already, do that. Because that, yeah. that just makes you, takes away the guilt of spending money. Yeah. Now, is there anything that you like to splurge on regardless of cost? Is there one thing that like, I don't care. This I'm getting this. No, I'm bad. I'm really, <laughs> I don't like to spend money. <laughs> That's too funny. See, and everybody knows this about me, sushi. I will spend on sushi. It's my favorite meal. Ah. If it's good sushi, I will pay for good sushi. I love a good sweet tea. Yeah. It's now, hard to find good sweet tea. Now, is that because you're in Florida? Because I grew up with sweet tea in Tennessee. And now it's like, at least in Tennessee, man, it's almost syrup. <laughs> yeah, that's the way mine is. Um, I can't make it anymore because I've hit that age where it just goes to the waste. I didn't, I wasn't raised on it. Yeah. I don't know. It, it, I think it was when we were building the log cabin and it yeah. was so stinking hot, like a hundred degrees every day. And I'd be like, eat something cold to drink. I don't know. Yeah. That's my vice. Sweet tea. That's a good vice. Well, we're at our M&M moment, our sweet spot and money and motivation. I'm wondering if you could give the listeners a practical financial tip or a piece of wealth wisdom. Yes. This was a game changer for me. If you are struggling with your money and it's so tight, do whatever you can to get one month totally ahead on everything and then forget that you are one month ahead on everything. Yeah. <laughs> like have a month in reserve. Pay this month's bills with last month's income. A lot of people pay this month's bills with this month's income. Right. And then they're always stressed out because they have 20 cents in their account. If you can give yourself margin, that just relaxes you. And gives you so much more peace. Yeah, I think that's so important because so many people live paycheck to paycheck. And if you can just start to inch away at saving some money so that you've got that little bit of reserve or cushion. And if you can get to six months, fantastic. But just even getting a month, man, that gives you so much breathing room. Yeah, it just it does. does. It just does. Well, Rachel, you know, what I loved about this conversation and what I, I just love about you and what I love about your book is that there's a lot of vulnerability. I don't hear any blame. I didn't hear any blame for the good stuff, the bad stuff. I didn't hear blaming your parents. And it's interesting because I do hear some guests that really don't have a lot of blame. There's other people that are like, oh yeah, I can blame my mom and my dad and my school and my... And it's just, it's great to hear this place of not blaming anybody, not blame. Oh my God, we had five kids. It's the kids' fault <laughs> that we had to have all this extra spending. and. The willingness, even though it took a little bit, the willingness to be vulnerable and say, this was my story. This is my struggle. And if I could help one more person help themselves or help these kids help themselves, like there's something just really refreshing in actually just looking forward, knowing the past, learning from the past, but not holding on to it in a way that keeps you held back. And I just really highly recommend this book. I am not your ATM. There's just so much great practical information there. And there's a lot of just personal information. And you've documented all of it. And you have you've stood in your birthday suits and said, this is us. And we're enough. And I think that's a piece. And we didn't talk about it a lot. But this piece about so many people think they're not enough. And knowing that you are enough. Just as you are. Whether you're living in a mansion or whether you're a busboy working your way to something else. You're enough. Right. And things are changeable. Life is fluid. There's always possibility when you're committed. And you talked about that being committed and just taking a forward motion, a forward step. There's so much possibility. Yeah, there is. There's always a way out. 
I think what your book does is gives people hope. Yeah. I just want to talk a little bit about you, Bob. We met at FinCon. Yep. I was brand new to the financial content space because yeah. I've done financial stuff for a long time and I've done content for a long time, but never financial content. The book just came out like all of a sudden I said, I need to write a book. And that just happened last year. And so I didn't know anybody in FinCon. And I met you at the book table. Yep. And you are just, I don't know how to, a friend to everyone. Like you just love to talk to people. And you've been in the space a long time and you could be, and I have seen other people that are like this where they think they know everything. They think they've arrived, you know, they yeah. like you're a newbie. You don't know anything, but you don't, you're not like that. You're a good soul. Well, <laughs> a good friend. I appreciate that. I will be learning till the day I take my last breath. I don't ever want to think that I've arrived. I want the journey to keep lasting for as long as possible. And there's so much great, rich information so with so many people. And so I want to, I really do want to stay open to hearing everybody's story because it may be just the piece of information that I need to pivot yeah. to raise me up to the next step. Well, you're just so approachable and you're a great asset to the FinCon community. Thank you so much. I love this stuff. I'm passionate about it. I know my money struggles were not fun. I don't want other people to have to feel like they're in it alone and that there's no shame in not having gotten the financial literacy or being handed a silver spoon. Like we can all change our future. And so I live on hope and forward motion. So thank you. Ugh, it's just been so great. Where can people find you on social media and on the internet so we can get you to the New York bestseller and tell you millions of books? <laughs> I am on Facebook and Instagram at Rachel Murphy Coaching. I've set up a special page just for listeners of this podcast on my website, rachelmurphycoaching.com slash money. And I'll have some free resources on there, recommended books for helping you teach your teens, a tracker if you're like, oh, I really would like to start doing that, a tracker to help you keep track of all the money you spend on your teen so you can formulate a plan and just links to our podcast that we have for teens. Awesome. Hold up your book one more time. I want everybody to see this book. Take a picture. Go get it. There you go. I am not your ATM. Folks, check out that book, Rachel Murphy. It's an amazing book. We'll have all that in the show notes. It's an awesome read. If you want to be intentional in your parenting, which I hope everybody does, give your children some resource. And this is a great place to start. Rachel, thank you so much. I hope that I'm going to see you at FinCon next year. Yes. And I can't wait for your next book. And I look forward to all that you have to bring. People listen to her podcast. Get your kids listening. Get empowered. Get inspired. And buy a book. Thanks. Had a great time. It's great. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Did you learn something new about your relationship to money today? Maybe you have a friend who has some financial blocks or beliefs that are holding them back. Please share this podcast so they too can get off the roller coaster ride of financial fears and journey towards financial freedom. To learn how to have a healthy relationship with money, visit themoneynerve.com. That's nerve, not nerd. We'll be back next week with another perspective on money and the emotions that bind us. Blah, blah, blah.